and our rivals who are engaged in hybrid conflict, hybrid war, distorted news, disinformation, malware embedded in the system and willing to roll those cards. We're in a system where we say, no, ethically, we can't do that. And I think as long as we're in that situation, we remain in a way sitting ducks to an agenda and to provocations that come particularly from Russia, but they also come from China um, and Iran and other places. And I, I sort of think we have a problem. Welcome and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Taneo Political Risk Advisory in, in New York City. Well, this is our final broadcast of this year. And so we thought, what better way to get into the holiday spirit than to discuss American politics and American policymaking uh, as we head into, into next year. At the very least, it'll make you feel better about everything else going on in your life, probably. Um, and 2022 is certainly gearing up to be another contentious and complicated year. COVID-related hospitalizations and deaths are climbing again, still due to the Delta variant uh, and before the Omicron variant becomes the dominant variant in the, in the country. Um, the infrastructure bill uh, was the signature legislative achievement thus far of the Biden administration. But the Build Back, Build Back Better bill uh, has yet to advance and may not do so for months to come. Uh, and the pivotal, pivotal figure here, of course, is not President Biden himself, but rather the senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Meanwhile, inflation, uh, as measured by consumer prices, has surged to a 40-year high, uh, The federal resulting in the Federal Reserve just yesterday signaling that they will accelerate the tapering uh, uh, of Treasury and mortgage bank security purchases. Uh, so the program concludes early in the next year, uh, and they are signaling three 25 basis point hikes to the federal funds rate, uh, which has been held near zero since March of 2020. And by the way, in a surprise move this morning, the Bank of England tightened for the first time since the pandemic, um, despite a clearly worsening COVID situation uh, in the UK. On the foreign policy front, the president is trying to reassert U.S. leadership without actually veering so far from his predecessor's policies. Uh, and meanwhile, China continues to militarize and threaten Taiwan. Russia is massing 100,000 plus troops on the Ukrainian border um, and talks with the Iranians uh, over their nuclear program are barely progressing uh, as they continue to enrich uranium. Plus, we have all of the other big picture items, including climate change, the energy transition, tech regulation, et cetera, et cetera. All of this as we barrel toward the midterm elections in November with, both, with control of both houses of Congress at stake but also important state and local elections as well. And oh, you know, for good measure, uh, in this highly polarized moment, the Supreme Court uh, will be ruling on a number of important issues, including effectively Roe versus Wade before the election. So if I'm the Santa uh, of our holiday program here, my two elves today are, well, they're two guys who are actually bigger than I am. <laughs> First of all, Steve Clemens is with us. He's editor at large at The Hill formerly with The Atlantic, and among his many other endeavors, published the well-read uh, political blog, The Washington Note. He's a longtime friend of Taneo and a frequent guest on Taneo Insights. And Orson Porter, uh, he runs Taneo's Washington, D.C. office and leads our government affairs efforts. He's a former White House official and was the uh, U.S. Director uh, of Government and Public Affairs for Nike. But um, knowing him the way I do, I think he was focused only on the golf division of that, uh, of that company while he was there. So welcome, fellas. Um, you know, like I said, uh, there's a lot going on. Holiday dinners are coming up. So Steve, maybe you can set the table uh, here for us. I mean, from the Washington perspective, you know, um, what, are you, what are you looking at as we head into the next year here? And amongst all of those myriad variables, and I just scratched the surface, you know, what do you think is really uh, at play and we really ought to be focusing on? Well, Kevin, thank you. And, you know, your survey of what we all need to be thinking about was so good. It's very hard to find anything. All I'll say is that, you know, in spirit of Christmas, you know, I've always been happy that my initials SC were Santa Claus and Steve Clemens. So uh, for whatever it's worth, and it's great to be on with my buddy Orson. Um, look, I, I think that, that everything you laid out shows how rocky, how cloudy, how uncertain um, the future is. I was out last night 
um, with some folks. It would happen to be a, a lobbyist, Tommy Quinn's 84th birthday, and Joe Crowley was there. But there were a lot of aspirants who were planning to run uh, for office. I met a guy who was going to uh, run in Mike Doyle's seat in Pittsburgh um, and kind of giving the lay of the land. If how do you, And he just, I said, what's your primary? And it just hit me. He says, oh, my God, it's in May. I mean, his primary is in May for 2020. Of course it's in May. But, you know, in, in, you know, it just seems around the corner. And it's a reminder that the setup we have right now as we go from this point into January and February is the setup that's going to be the, uh, 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 the framing, the scaffolding in voters' minds um, in the various parties, both Republican and Democrat, when they come in. And, and that means that this White House is going to have very little latitude in this moment, to, I think, to shape that narrative. I mean, we're just, we're just already there. And so, you know, in my book, um, you mentioned Senator Manchin, who I, I um, happen to uh, spend a lot of time with. And so I, I get a, a download from the senator and where, where he's thinking. And, you know, I know that he was, uh, um, I guess, I'll count. are we off the record here, by the way? I'm saying that as a journalist. No. No. OK, OK. Then, well, well, I will say that a senator I know told um, a senior person in the White House unnamed that uh, they were saying, hey, you know, Senator, we need, you know, hey, Joe, we need to you know, push this bill back better. we got to get going. we got to get moving, got to impact the elections. And uh, Joe's saying, you know, we've got six point eight percent inflation. We've got the Russians on the Ukrainian border. Who knows what that is going to do uh, to energy prices? We have um, a, another variant of of covid that we're wrestling with and don't know the extent of don't know what the costs are going to be and whether or not we should be you know putting significant resources and money into you know an, an, another set of of scientific investments to deal with you know pan right so he says there's a lot of economic uncertainty out there why don't you wait till march or april well but waiting till march or april is very unsatisfactory to a lot of democrats so he was pushing and this this senior white person you know was pushing hard and so senator manchin said hey go ahead call a vote let's see how it goes and so he was basically sending the signal he's not there um and we've seen in the last i would say 18 hours a very big shift uh here in washington where everyone reals, realizes chuck schumer will not get the build back vote, uh, better vote before christmas and that all eyes have now turned to voting rights um, as the next as the next possibility with Manchin. But I would basically point out that there probably is little possibility there. But the idea is to do a watered down version of this. Somehow some Republicans go, you know, go on and, and that and that Manchin allows some form of filibuster carve out. I don't see the likelihood of that as very high, but that's sort of there. But I think the bigger tectonic issues right now is that the Biden team is looking at um, a situation that they can overcome. But, you know, I, we, we at the Hill partner with Mark Penn and the Harvard-Harris poll. So I take a look at those poll numbers. And Biden's job approval has, has improved just a little bit over the last month. Um, and I think that's notable. But he's down on a majority of looking at every classification of issue of management from the White House. You know, he has disapprovals, greater than approvals in everything but coronavirus. Um, and if I were the White House, I'd be worried about that because his approval ratings really were higher when the when the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed. And for some reason, uh, we can talk about that. Perhaps the infrastructure bill didn't become the dominant frame that the president securing the largest infrastructure bill in generations is not being read as a success by the public about Joe Biden. The lowest unemployment rate that I can ever remember. <clears throat> actually is not being read as a success and so when you kind of look at the fact that so many elements of the economy are actually doing well but there is this sense of stress and anxiety uh that continues to permeate people you know that 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 uh you know people that we still have a huge jobs gap and there is a genuine concern that many small businesses are not going to go under you know because of of uh suspended economic activity they're going to go under because they don't have staffing they don't have jobs you know, they don't have people filling these positions. That's a really palpable problem. And I honestly um, don't don't see how the administration fixes that before the election coming up. If you were to, according to, again, this poll, if you had an um, election tomorrow, Trump beats Biden 48 to 45 percent. He beats Buttigieg 48 to 37 percent. He beats Harris 50 to 41 percent. So when you kind of look at the snapshot of where we're at right now, this controversial president we had in the past, for whom there's a January 6th commission underway in which we're getting more and more revelations about uh, trying to overturn the election results is nonetheless riding high 
with a significant number of both Republicans and independents, um, unfortunately, in my, in my book, unfortunately. So, you know, and as you said, I think um, the, the, some of the international dimensions, and a lot of times it, we get focused on the domestic dimensions, we forget about the international. I think as a guy who follows the international scene a lot, the Russia-Ukraine thing is, is not minor. It's very hard to see how Putin backs up all of a sudden. He may not go ahead, but it's kind of showing something that we haven't yet reconciled in our own mind and I think in our economy, that America and the solvency of its relationships with other nations is, is, is wobbly. And, and while Ukraine is not a treaty ally of the United States, and it's not there, but what happens you with Ukraine, if, if it were to continue to remain gray or get messy, creates real problems with the question of solvency with real NATO allies, like in the Balkans, but I would also say other countries in Eastern Europe. And my sense is that Vladimir Putin um, does not want to not test that and that the threats that the White House put together is there. And I think that there are significant economic consequences and costs. So Manchin has been raising this a lot as to what happens to oil uh, and gas prices in that context. What happens, you know, on a, on a, on a lot of other fronts. It's not an issue of what, whether Putin invades Ukraine or not. It's the economic um, uh, shocks that come with regard to how people read power. And as you know, I tell people power is like the stock market. It's a function of future expectations. And right now, future expectations of American solvency on this stuff is in doubt, whereas China and Russia are looked at as more definitive sculptors of the international scene and economics. And so I could have that very wrong, but I think we understate the importance of that on, on questions about this. And then you've seen tapering you know, picked up. I mean, this is another thing Manchin was pushing Jay Powell on. And so Manchin right now is getting a lot of what he wants. Um, but that means the Democratic Party base is not getting a lot of it once. And why don't I just stop there? But I think that's the picture that it's very, very messy. And by the time we begin seeing primaries uh, in these House races and then eventually get to 2022, um, right now it's not a good scene for the Democrats. So I want to uh, we're going to unpack a lot of that. And I want, but I want to bring Orson into the conversation here. But before I do, just two, two quick follow up questions. One mm -hmm. is in, in the poll that you just referred to. What was your sense of, I mean, I know you, you talked about a sort of a minor turn up in the, in yeah. the president's approval rating there. Is there, is, is there something that accounts for that? Is, was there some sort of a catalyst or was it just, uh, it sort of had gone down as far as it, it was going to go? Well, it had been in the low 30s, but in the last measure point in October, you know, Penn had it at 43%. Now it's at 45%, which you could argue is not horrible, um, but it's below water. But, but Mark was saying, hey, the president has at least stabilized his numbers. But he, he accounts has said there was a real popularity in the infrastructure bill, that the infrastructure bill was looked at as a success. And what I'm confused by is why the administration, after such a success, um, in which there, were, there was a clear bump up, backed themselves up in the corner, not to be defined by that success, but now to be defined by the challenge of whether they pass Build Back Better, which was always suspect, in my view, in terms of whether they had the votes and counts. So they back themselves up into this moment um, and define this moment around around whether that succeeds or fails. And so it's almost as if, in my book, the infrastructure bill is no longer a contributor to it. Now, now I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not a pollster, but but I do find that an yeah. interesting self-inflicted wound of this administration. Yeah, I mean, you sort of answered my second question there as well. I mean, I was going to ask that very about this very issue, though. It does seem that the that the sort of the afterglow of the infrastructure uh, success was going to be always sort of you know time limited because there's a there's a lag between the vote, you know, shovels actually hitting the ground in all of these projects, and then the actual economic and jobs benefit um, from that was always was always going to take time, I guess, uh, as well. But you're your point on then, you know, um, the, the 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 limitations of any success on BBB is also uh, is also well taken. So, Orson, you know, um, Steve's laid out the picture here very comprehensively. I guess my question to you would be: Do you have anything you would want to add to that? But but importantly, you converse with corporate leadership um, around the country daily. So. You know, what are they seeing as kind of the big issues going into this year? Or what do you think they ought to be focusing on yet that they are not? 
Well, thanks, uh, first and foremost, foremost for having me on the show today. Uh, and secondly, I just want to send a shout out to Mr. Clemens. Uh, I was honored to be in the presence of his big ceremony at the French Embassy, uh, where he received the Medal of Honor in a, in a town that's basically shut down. Uh, it was on uh, for Mr. Clemens, uh, where there were at least a dozen elected officials, senators, diplomats, journalists. Uh, and as I told Mr. Clemens, there's only one person that people would come out for, uh, and that was him. Uh, so maybe the SC is Santa Claus, but on that particular <laughs> evening, uh, it definitely worked. Congratulations. And was that out of, was that out of love or out of fear, Orson? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. But to uh, get to your point, I, I think a, a couple of things to throw out on Build Back Better before I get to the client piece is, you know, let's let's not forget over the last basically year and a half, two years, Congress has approved $4.5 trillion in spend, spending, which is a lot of money. Yeah. I, I think there are a lot of folks who are a little whiplashed. Uh, and as Steve rightly pointed out, um, People were excited and will be excited about the infrastructure piece, but I think Mansion may be on to something. Um, you know, the initial price tag of Build Back Better was 3.5 trillion. Now it's down to what 1715. At the end of the day, it could be under 1 trillion. Uh, so we're, you know, we're looking at nearly it could be six trillion dollars in two years of spending. Uh, and that's a lot of money. Um, so it's something to think about. The key date uh, to watch on Build Back Better isn't necessarily the end of year or Christmas as everyone's uh, proclaiming that it's most important uh, date to watch. I think it's uh, January 12th when the Department of Labor uh, issues its inflationary numbers. And if the yeah. December numbers uh, were as challenging as the November numbers, uh, then I think uh, we may have a prolonged discussion on the need to spend, as I mentioned, uh, $6 trillion over a two-year period uh, if the inflationary numbers continue to peak out. So with that, uh, what should clients uh, be thinking about? And I put a list of goodies uh, together for today's call uh, as I see it. Uh, one of the things, if I were uh, a head of GA, which I was, <laughs> or a great company called Nike, um, you know, at the top of the list is this whole ESG discussion. Uh, I think it will bleed into a lot of the agencies from a, a regulatory uh, actions uh, piece, from a social justice piece, from an environmental piece, uh, from a diversity and inclusion piece. Uh, I think it will be one of the biggest things outside of passing legislations that CEOs and corporate offices should be paying attention to. Uh, another thing, uh, because uh, there may not be a whole lot of le legislative activity, is the likelihood of Democrats using uh, their ability to call on hearings. Uh, and I would imagine, and Steve probably could speak to this, but there will be a, a large, uh, massive load of CEOs, as we've seen in the tech community and others, testifying before Congress uh, in the next uh, several months uh, until actually the election day, whether it's tech CEOs, whether it's speaking on CEO pay, uh, could be about, you know, you receive this amount in stimulus fund funding, uh, where did the money go, uh, tax discussion, trade, labor, environment. I, I just see the possibility of CEOs testifying before Congress uh, being re very high. Uh, the other thing uh, to watch out, of course, is COVID. Kevin, you were right to mention uh, that COVID is still uh, at the top of the list. Uh, when we had this, I think, call right after the election uh, last year, it was at the top. When we, when we got together in January, we talked about what the big issue is COVID. And I think COVID remains until we figure out a better plan uh, will be uh, an item that not only uh, has you know consequences on the elderly and what happens in DC, uh, but at the end of the day, I think it will have a lot of influence on 
what happens from a legislative perspective and the need uh, should we uh, unfortunately go backwards uh, to raise that that four point five trillion dollars in stimulus to reconsider what we've already spent or to do another package uh, that will be interesting to watch uh, with the Winter Olympics coming up uh, definitely uh, the discussion on China uh, and human rights and supply chains uh, will be at the top of the list as Steve mentioned voting rights there's already are, there has already been a pivot towards uh, that discussion uh, I think with the upcoming um, February slot for Black History Month look for civil rights leaders to really press corporations to take a position on voting rights. Uh, I think uh, the issue of fuel costs uh, for uh, the winter uh, will be an issue that CEOs will have to pay careful attention to. Uh, one thing that I know for certain, if, if you're not uh, thinking about and, and you head up a DC office, uh, the PAC giving uh, leading up to 2022 midterm elections on who was on the list, uh, you know, who the January 6th uh, incident, um, you know, people really wanting to put a whole lot of daylight on what who corporations gave to and why, uh, and their reasoning, I think, will be a, a big deal. We've already mentioned uh, some of the Supreme Court activities. The, the one curveball I'll throw out uh, for you guys uh, to chew on is climate. Not a discussion in climate in that through the lens of climate change, change but uh, really through the lens of, you know, 2021 has been one of, one of the most costliest uh, years we've had for the federal government to uh, assist on disasters. We just saw what happened uh, with the tornadoes, uh, we've seen some of the corporate uh, community or citizens uh, be called upon to explain themselves uh, on, uh, you know, OSHA reviewing uh, workplace uh, decisions. I just think, you know, as we continue to have these incidents, uh, and unfortunately, as we saw, you know, a large number of, of workers who lost their jobs, uh, it would not surprise me um, that Congress uh, really puts uh, pressure on corporations to make uh, better decisions and to be more transparent on how uh, there are going to be solid neighbors, but more importantly, uh, with the onslaught of these disasters, how are they keeping their employees safe? So I'll stop there. I know that was a lot to chew on. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm exhausted that. already. Uh, I'm listening to both of you guys, but um, I guess one, one quick question here, uh, because it is uh, rapidly approaching. You brought it up um, very quickly there, which was the Olympics. Um, so obviously the United States and uh, a number of its allies have announced these uh, quote unquote diplomatic boycotts. Um, but, you know, the games are going, going forward. Um, American athletes will perform there. NBC will broadcast these games and advertisers will be there. What will be the, well, you know, I, I know there will be sort of grassroots, um, you know, complaints against a lot of those companies for their sponsorship of these games. What will come out of Washington uh, on this? Can make the difference between life and death. Somebody needs to mute something. Okay, thanks. Any 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 thoughts on that, Orson? Yeah, I think you know it, it will be those who are, you know, particularly corporations who sponsor uh, the Olympics. It will be, um, from a congressional perspective, uh, it will be about the networks uh, who produce the games, uh, which will be a, a dicey discussion. Uh, and then I think because what, you know, journalists like Steve and others, uh, it will be the investigative reporting before the Olympics on the human rights issues, highlighting uh, some of those corporate potential corporate sponsors or others, uh, and it could be the athletes. The athletes are the game changers, uh, as we've seen uh, throughout the years, uh, who may partner up with some congressional leaders to make some surprise statements during the games. 
So you guys have both mentioned here, um, and, and I brought it up at the top of the call, uh, obviously the midterm elections and others. So let's let's talk about that for, for one second here. Um, and, and, and Steve, maybe again, set the table on, on what we're, what you're thinking and what you're expecting. I know that we're 11 months away from these things, but as you pointed out, the primaries, which are actually are the elections in many of these uncontestable seats, essentially, uh, those primaries are right around the corner, effectively, uh, only six months away or so. Um, and, and of course, you know, it would probably be more notable if the president's party uh, midway through his through his term wasn't going to get um, wasn't going to get hit. Um, you know, President Obama uh, was was two years into his term when he when or a year into his term when when Virginia went the other way in the governorship and those off year elections and he went on to win uh, win reelection and the like. So what do you, what are you what are you seeing or how are you teeing up the uh, the midterms uh, right now? And then Orson, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, some of the state and local stuff as as well. Well, well, well listen, I you mean I, th- I hate to be one of these people. It could go either two ways. Could it could go two ways? I think I think right now it's looking very messy and you know very hard for the administration to you know at least keep the house. I also think the Senate um, is in jeopardy, but the Republicans shoot themselves in the foot in a lot of these races, which we've been seeing. So um, you know the, the the Senate may be an easier hold, but but uh, well bear hold. But I think that the you know the way things are are going right now and and look i i am a um natural born cynic um so when you know i tend to over you know emphasize perhaps the negatives but i think that there is a strategy in the white house that felt as if it had to play towards the left towards being on paid with paid leave towards child you know care support towards you know, these big, what they call social infrastructure, which are huge costs. Manchin calls them new entitlements. Um, And then have that crash down, have the consequences look like, and and to try to turn their supporters into folks that are frustrated and angry with what's not being given to them because of the mansions, because of the right, and because of the uh, uh, party. So, you can say, well, one hand, you know, Joe Biden hasn't delivered what he said he was going to deliver, so we're not going to turn out. You know, we're not being bribed to turn out at the election polls. Or they could see voting rights not go forward, and they can see the um, efforts at voter suppression. They could see Build Back Better failed. And so you could have a weird bank shot where, you know, folks, and Stacey Abrams is really good at this, of, of reminding people that they have to fight for their position, fight for their status, and turn these failures into a lot. I think it's that the chances of that happening are very low, but it exists. And I've I've talked to folks in the White House who honestly are ambivalent about voting rights passing, that acting like you want voting rights to pass, but having it fail may be a better motivator to get people out to vote than actually succeeding in getting voting rights passed and paying, you know, the earnest, you know, linear way being deliberate about that and then people really not understanding what it took to get there so i mean so it's a little bit of a bank shot approach to this but where i kind of come out one thing we didn't talk about that i wanted to raise a discussion you know i think there is this overall frustration now you know i was uh, with the polish ambassador yesterday morning and he was saying you know you americans toss around communism and socialism what he says i told him you know give me 800 words about what communism really meant because what I was telling them is, 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 you know, there's some people when I try and order a component for my computer or I try to order a light or I want to put in a swimming pool or a jacuzzi or you want to buy a car. It feels like the old Soviet Union uh, in my in my book where you waited a year to get what you were. There were long lines. The stores were out of stuff. I mean, we're in a period with global supply chain where it's impacting people in their daily lives. And that frustration I think is only going to get worse and build. And what do you feel like that? You want to blame whoever seems to be in charge. And so I think that's going to be another one of these malaise factors that makes it hard for the for what I first laid out to be there. Because I basically be, believe people vote pocketbook, vote economy, and vote on whether their life is getting better or worse. And I think by those measures, a lot of people feel like their life and life experience is just damn frustrating you know, in terms of getting what they want. They don't have just-in-time economy more, just-in-time jobs, just-in-time money. There was a high-trust economy. Now we have 
a lot of fear and doubt and uncertainty built into the economy. And I think Americans are going to blame whoever they can blame. All right. So we're going to get to the economy here in just a second. But Orson, um, so it sounds like the 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 way that Steve has set this up is, is that uh, as as probably many anticipate, um, the Democrats will lose control of the House. The Senate remains sort of in play. Um, but let's talk about uh, the state and local um, uh, elections. There are some key races um, that are important out there. Uh, maybe highlight some of those. But also, you've talked a lot to me about how the Republicans, as we saw in Virginia, um, have shifted or have defined what the elections are uh, are going to be uh, about um, in 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 many of the races and the success that they are uh, that they're having on that on that front. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say Steve Clemens has never waited in a line in his life. Uh, just check on that. <laughs> I mean, this guy has an express pass at Whole Foods. But anyway, <laughs> you know, one thing I, I, I jotted down some notes just to kind of echo what Steve said on the federal side, and I'll quickly shift to your question, Kevin, is, you know, Barack Obama lost 63 seats in the House the year after um, he passed the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Trump lost 40 seats uh, in the House uh, a couple months after the, he, you know, passed the um, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Clinton, uh, my my old boss, my friend, uh, lost nearly um, 52 House seats, eight Senate seats after he signed the biggest piece of uh, his legacy, the, the NAFTA agreement. Um, so, you know, even though Biden has passed the infrastructure piece and maybe passed uh, Build Back Better, uh, as they say in the streets, history don't lie. Uh, and it's going to be a really, really hard uphill climb for Democrats to maintain momentum there. On the state and local side uh, next year, you know, there will be nearly 36 uh, governor races open, uh, or I should say, um, we'll have 36 governor races throughout the U.S., uh, 15 on the Republican, 13 on the Dem, 8 on uh, as in open seats. You know, the big issues there, of course, um, will be things like the education, as we saw in Virginia, uh, infrastructure on who got what, workforce development, not enough jobs, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I think on the state and local piece, and even the federal piece, when, when I was brought into politics during the Clinton days, you know, it was don't stop thinking about tomorrow um, and the future. You know, elections were really built around the future. Uh, on the state and local race, the election and midterm elections in these governor's races will be about what's happening today. Uh, and candidates who can't talk about why kids are at home because of COVID, candidates who can't talk about why gas prices are so high, why is the price of bread or et cetera doubled, candidates who can't talk about uh, why it's unsafe uh, for me to uh, leave the house at 10 because crime is so high. Did you see what was in the news last night? Uh, we'll be in trouble. So, I, you know, to answer your question, Kevin, and I think this is an issue for both parties, and, and maybe the Republicans did a better job of it in Virginia, but elections really are no longer based on five years on can my kid go to college. It's really about is my kid safe to walk to school, and if so, will he catch COVID? One question here, you, 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 um, you know, Steve brought up the uh, the voting rights issues and um, the sort of uh, per perhaps counterintuitive um, uh, view from what, how the White House might be might be looking at it. I want to ask another question though, because we have seen news reports a lot of late of um, you know uh, the Republicans in particular um, making 
it clear that they want to run in a lot of races that are typically kind of operate below the radar screen. Oftentimes they are uncontested and so on and so forth, but it is for election officials type positions in various states and, uh, and local elections. Um, and, it, you know, it's notable, of course, that uh, since 1988, I think only one Republican presidential candidate has actually won the popular vote. Um, you know, does this is, is this something that is is concerning in in, in Washington? Are the Democrats going to try to run as competitive of candidates for these for these positions? Or what's the how, how, how concerning is this trend? Or is it? I, I, you know, I'll take a stab at it quickly. I know Steve's got to hopefully have a good opinion on it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think what we saw during the presidential election with, with Trump, and I, and I have a lot of friends who happen to be election commissioners, uh, whether, you know, fr friends in Wisconsin or uh, friends in Illinois or in Georgia, and they all said that the system worked. Um, and they were proud of that. Uh, and I think, you know, regardless of what these individuals may proclaim, what they thought they saw, uh, at the end of the day, I think probably the greatest gift we got out of the recent election, even though um, the polls may disprove it, is that uh, people took a real serious look at the process and I think those who were honest about it walked away and said uh, it actually worked. Uh, and I think with these officials who, who may be, you know, supportive of what Trump is trying to do, it will be very hard for them uh, to find anything but a system that really works. Uh, and it's been very hard to disprove that it, it doesn't. You know, I agree 100 percent with Orson. Um, that said, you know, I think it's true that, you know, in, in, in what used to be innocuous kind of bland races like secretaries of state, that you're going to see more money and more effort to control who goes in those seats. And I think there's this view if you get somebody who's, you know, was was is very supportive of Donald Trump, that they're somehow committing themselves to lie, to perjure, to distort. And I have to tell you that, you know, our system is designed to create a lot of legal liability and accountability and financial responsibility. If you go into a government position and fail to execute that position. So there's this fantasy that Donald Trump can just come up with a lot of uh, minions and, and, and put them in these spots. But, you know, our system will sue these people into oblivion. Um, and that's not really been told in the media in the stories covering this. So I agree with Orson that it large, you know, the system largely held and the efforts now to distort it or stack it with people is going to be balanced by it's going to be messy. Um, we're going to see cases and boutique cases in parts of the country where people are trying to get a hold of the election infrastructure. But I have to tell you, there are too many. I mean, there look, there are checks and balances built into the system. And people develop individual liability, and we're forgetting that. And we're beginning to see even the city of D.C. sue uh, the Oath Keepers and, and the Proud Boys and, you know, institutions that are coming. I imagine Merrick Garland with, what, you know, white supremacist groups is going to eventually begin going after the fiscal agents for these groups uh, and begin, some of which are faith-based, and begin, you know, undermining some of the financial infrastructure behind some of this um, out there. So, you know, I, I think we're, yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally with Orson on this. Guys, these are really interesting points. And I think that uh, it's unfortunate to your point, the, the, the Steve, the, the media hasn't really captured that element of it as a rather what they are doing is raising the red flag that, you know, this right. is like, you know, electoral Armageddon that's, uh, that's, that's coming. So hopefully we'll see, we'll see more of that, but let's turn back to the economy because you guys have both sort of touched on this point of how, critical the pocketbook is to uh, to to elections as it as it always is. And, you know, one of the one of the really interesting dynamics here, of course, is that we have gone from an employment situation, which was an absolute crisis to a pretty benign um, situation overall. I mean, the amount of the unemployment rate that the, 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 the drop in the last year in the last cycle took three and a half years to make that kind of a um, uh, to make that kind of a move. And by the way, the Fed started tightening 
um, you know, uh, or tapering, you know, way before uh, we had gotten to this point in the uh, in, in the election cycle. So aside from the non-farm payrolls or the, the new jobs numbers themselves, the employment data continues to move uh, in, in, in the right uh, in the right direction. Um, so in, in, in many ways, uh, the economy is on good financial uh, good financial footing, and in fact, you know, even inflation has a silver lining on uh, on 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 debt levels and so on and so forth. But there is something else here, right? Because polls also show that people are very negative about the trajectory of the economy. They may feel good about their own personal situation, but in general, they're feeling negative. It seems to me that there is some sort of conscious or subconscious concern about inflation that that is really what is uh what, what's um affecting a lot of people's views here but what do you how do you see it and how do how does how is washington looking at the economic picture right now <laughs> well you know i think the american public is like so irritated that yet again, we have another what appears to be a financial crisis. You know, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, subprime loan crisis that undermined their 401ks, you know, put a lot of their mortgages underwater. And, and you just have a whole class of working class Americans who feel screwed by the system and think New York is gaming them again. I mean, for you folks in the finance community, you know, I know it's a different story, but Americans don't trust and so when they now see, wow, now inflation is undermining the assets we have, it's like another, it's like another gut punch of the American middle class. And I think that is frustrating to Americans. They may not understand economics, um, but, you know, as Larry Summers said yesterday in a meeting, um, you know, Janet Yellen and um, uh, Powell, Jay Powell, have stopped using the word transitory because, you know, part of the the game from the White House to say, oh, this was a temporary spike, it was going away. Well, now the framing is changing. And I think Americans feel screwed by economists and by people who aren't being honest and straightforward about the conditions and circumstances. And when Summers was out there early, you know, um, blowing the whistle, we didn't know the numbers then. And he ended up being right and people kind of walking away from him. I think it's, it's, it's increased, you know, what I said earlier, it's very interesting. Americans largely, we were in a place, I used to call this during the time of Bill Clinton, we had a kind of such high trust that people had, they, they could lose their job one day and get a job the next day. They had money coming in, you know, it would come in, there was a just-in-time sense, just like in manufacturing, but I called it just-in-time jobs, just-in-time money, just-in-time trade, you know, it, it was all working. And all of that trust in the system has somehow evaporated. And I mean, you can get a job if you have a heartbeat and want to work in a restaurant, but, but you know, otherwise um, there is uncertainty and anxiety about the future. We also have a lot of people where there's a huge demand, say for truck drivers and, you know, people moving packages right now, but they know automation is around the, the corner and they see technology coming in as a huge displacing effect potentially to come in there. So even where the numbers are good, there remains anxiety about the future. And I, I, I think that, that, that the, but, but you're right. I mean, fundamentally, if you look at some of the numbers that are out there, except inflation, it's hard to imagine, you know, a better un, un, unemployment rate than we have, right? We're pr practically at full employment. Um, you know, I think people should be asking, hey, what, what, you know, where were those, you know, on, on immigration or illegal immigration? Guess what? A lot of those illegal immigrants may have been filling in a lot of these spots before. Um, but I want to I don't want to go down that lane, but I do think it's part of the picture that we've so successfully closed off, you know, infusion of certain workers at a certain level that they're not they're not there anymore. And we have to ask ourselves, can our economy, uh, can small businesses and can the service sector, you know, work without that? But but I think that that right now um, inflation is the biggest is the biggest concern. And I'll put in one other thing with all the money you know, or Orson talked about the six trillion we've spent and debating this. Now, I don't know the exact number, but our, I do know that in, in current dollars, so equated for current dollars, that amount is more than we spent in all of World War II and the Marshall Plan. And so when you kind of look at what we've done to intervene in this economy and to inject it, and, and, and you know, Donald Trump also did that when he came in. There was also a big, giant um, escalation in the, in the national debt. And I think it's just all added up to a lot of anxiety. And Americans just want a break without seeming like they're being gut punched 
and their assets are being undermined. So in a, um, in a blatant moment of self-promotion here, you've brought up Larry Summers' name a couple times. I will just tell everybody that he will be our guest on this show on February 10th, so one of our early mm -hmm. uh, New Year uh, guests, and we'll unpack all of that. Um, but, you know, Steve brought up something interesting here, Orson, as well, uh, which is this sort of maybe in the back of people's minds concern about automation and, you know, being robotically taken out of your job down the, down the road and so on and so forth. When it comes to bipartisanship on, on the Hill, we always think about China, first of all, maybe Iran. Um, but one thing that, uh, that, that both, both, uh, both parties do seem to go after, albeit for different reasons necessarily, is big tech um, and things like AI and, and, and all of that. Where do you, do you see movement on that front uh, in, the, uh, in the year to come? Yeah, that's a great question, Kevin. You know, I do think after, if they ever do pass um, Build Back Better, <laughs> uh, I'm guessing uh, closer to the State of the Union or thereafter. Um, and if they don't get to voting voting rights, um, then the only thing that I think will fly uh, from a bipartisan standpoint is some kind of activity, legislative activity, on how to uh, work or police um, things on social media, such as, you know, TikTok, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably one of the issues that the staffers on Capitol Hill understand better than their bosses and it's staffers who write the legislation. But more importantly, uh, it's the parents who are calling uh, these congressional offices saying you have to do something. Um, so, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that there will be some piece of legislation uh, that will get some momentum uh, that will become ultra political, but highly bipartisan uh, to find a way to police some of these social media companies. But before they do that, going back to my earlier point, uh, I think you'll have three or four additional CEO hearings. Uh, where these CEOs will be called upon to testify, to explain themselves over and over again, uh, and then you'll see some sort of uh, uh, legislative activity. It's probably the only game in town, I think, that, that has uh, legislative wings, I think, as, as they say in Arkansas, that dog hunts. Uh, outside of that, you know, I really don't see Congress on, in a bipartisan effort other than you know, God forbid, an, another big uh, disaster uh, like a hurricane or, or tornado where they need immediate relief or a package. But outside of that, I think the big tech and community, uh, particularly on the social media piece uh, through the lens uh, of children, uh, will be something that I think you may get some bipartisan movement on. I, I agree so, a thousand percent. Well, let me just add one thing here. But yeah. I, I agree with um, Orson on that. But I think that, um, you know, the administration, I, in my view, by the administration, um, belly flopped on something that they failed to, to take advantage of the Endless Frontier Act, which passed bipartisan in the Senate. Chris Coons brought Republicans in and it dealt, it, you know, in a bipartisan way with how are we going to compete with China? We're going to compete with China by investing in science, by replenishing and doubling or tripling the National Science Foundation budget, the national labs, promoting partnerships with universities, you know, getting out there and looking at reshoring strategies, critical infrastructure, critical materials, looking at the global supply chain, you know, pharmaceutical industry, dependence abroad. And the so, you know, with BARDA and a lot of these elements were wrapped up into this really impressive piece of legislation that was a sort of response to China that was that had traction rather than bluster and Nancy Pelosi and her team decided they didn't like it. It passed the Senate. It's been floundering. But here was an opportunity for the Biden administration to follow up the infrastructure bill with something was about investing in our own scientific capacity, our AI, you know, the 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 the, the high tech arena quantum that we're talking about. And, you know, the House Democratic leadership was not on board with the bipartisan legislation. They so, well, I agree with Orson. Here's another example, just exactly framed as you had, where, you know, you show if you can't pass that bill. And it really, in, in my book, was one of the most important and necessary piece that, that would have found lots of partnerships with the private sector 
you know, particularly those in science and looking at, you know, the future of automation, technology, data, et cetera. And we flopped on it. You know, it's just sitting there. I mean, maybe it comes back at some point, but it's pretty interesting how the administration didn't didn't pick it up. So, uh, Steve, you just brought up China uh, again. So let's I want to turn back to the uh, to the foreign policy arena here for a second, because I, I, I agree with you that the um, that the Russia situation uh, is 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 bigger and and more concerning um, than 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 you know, even what it appears. Uh, and I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's very not black and white in a way, right? Between where they are today and a full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine, there are a million other things that they can do to ch to alter the facts on the ground, if you will. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be dictated by, um, you know, big dicta dictated by America or economic interests. And one of the things that Putin has been very good at uh, as have others, is being able to sort of drive a wedge uh, in the so-called Western alliance, right? So um, it may be more challenging. It was certainly more challenging under the Merkel government to uh, to want to use Nord Stream 2 pipeline as a leverage point against the Russians. Perhaps the new German government, considering that the Greens are involved, may have a, a slightly different view here. But this point that that, you know, President Biden has essentially said that, you know, U.S. military action uh, is, is off the table, which I think most Americans would be appreciative of in, in many ways. But on the other hand, it, it sends a very different signal to Putin, right, which is there's a lot you can do. Um, and probably no one is going to watch that more closely um, than China, who obviously is also trying to uh, take a revisionist and even revanchist uh, view of their own uh, of their own region. We think most obviously of Taiwan, but there's a lot of territorial disputes uh, between China and India, uh, and in the and in the waters against you know the Philippines and Vietnam and other countries as well. So where do you think we are right now? I have my views on on, on U.S. standing in the world and what the president is doing to actually recover it. But where do you wh what do you see? I think the Biden team is trying hard to slot America back into what it was before the Trump administration and is failing because trust in the United States was so badly damaged by the America first policies and the disregard for allies and the hugging up close to autocrats that the world doesn't trust the United States right now and Putin and Xi Jinping, but Putin more than, I mean, Xi Jinping, while I think he's watching what's going on is actually a much more careful calculator than Putin you know, who has fewer resources, but he's willing to gamble more. And I think, um, you know, and I think right now the administration is trying to say, we're back, we're back, you can trust us, we're important, we're important, and it sounds pathetic to the world, as opposed to coming out with a new strategy that's less reactive. I mean, I follow Tony Blinken's readouts, and if you read Tony Blinken's readouts, he's meeting with every little leader in the world constantly. There seems to be no priority, no uh, grand strategy. Well, the grand strategy was where well, we were going to have a pivot to Asia and prioritize China, not necessarily in a collision, but trying to manage that. And so resources, attention, you know, economic policy was going to be driven by this rise of China. As say. And Putin just using that to say, oh, I can I can weaponize migration on the border of Lithuania. I can get Belarus, you know, to push push folks from Iraq that they picked up on a plane, push them into Lithuania, push them into Poland. I can do, you know, large military exercises on the border of the Balkans. You know, I can, you know, make you play whack-a-mole and make you reactive. It's almost as if the more we talked about the pivot to Asia, the more Putin just says, I'm going to screw you guys over here. Do you can't live up to what you're saying? And that has created, you know, a question, you know, I, I think Biden made a mistake by saying there wouldn't be military action, even though I think many Americans, as you said, are, are, are relieved by that. But it, it, it creates a clarity of lack of, of commitment in one level. And then the economic measures they outlined, whether it's Nord Stream 2, but basically cutting the Russians out of the financial, you know, uh, SWIFT system, it have huge titanic economic consequences for us, right? I think regardless of what it does to the Russians, the notion that it's just easy for Europeans or others to come along. So I just think, you know, to some degree, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to say this carefully. Joe Biden needs to find a small country to bomb 
So he needs to demonstrate resolve in some way over something that matters to send a signal to these leaders that are trying to change lines and borders in the world that, that America and its allies are serious. And I don't know where that defining moment is going to be, but until that happens, until there's a kinetic collision, or until we take, I mean, we just had the Summit for Democracy. One big key leg of the Summit for Democracy was corruption and transnational crime and fighting all this. Sheldon Whitehouse was out there pushing this. And I'm saying, do you don't, don't you think our CIA knows where Vladimir Putin's hundreds of billions of dollars are parked uh, in various oligarchs? Why aren't we publishing a big roster of Putin assets and where they are and disclosing this? I mean, I think there are things that we could be doing short of war that we're not to show that we are um, serious. And I, you know, somebody put it to me the other night, I was with a group of congressmen, bipartisan actually. And, and, you know, the view is I said, you know, I sometimes feel like the United States is like we were in the, you know, in the Revolutionary War, we are the British redcoats, well-organized, regimented, beautifully dressed with a code of honor and a code of action. And, and the Russians have been the folks that are messy and nasty and in the woods and fighting us like militia, you know, uncoordinated. So we've become the British and our rivals who are engaged in hybrid conflict, hybrid war, distorted news, disinformation, malware embedded in the system and willing to roll those cards. We're in a system where we say, no, ethically, we can't do that. And I think as long as we're in that situation, we remain in a way sitting ducks to an agenda and to provocations that come particularly from Russia, but they also come from China um, and Iran and other places. And I, I sort of think we have a problem. And the, and the Biden administration right now doesn't have a game plan for figuring out how to be less polite, less ethical, and less impactful in foreign policy. And until that happens, I don't think much of the world is gonna take our alliances seriously. I agree. And I think that, um, you know, quite simply, I mean, the president himself has not actually articulated a China policy. I mean, little bits and pieces here and there, but no sweeping, considering it's the, the, the number one foreign policy challenge of our, of our generation. And we've just got the cumulative effect of, you know, foreign policy overreach in Iraq, red lines that weren't that weren't dealt with in Syria, um, alienation of allies. And of course, the messy departure from Afghanistan kind of has a compounding effect on, on the per perspective of or the perception of American leadership in the uh, in, in the world, to be sure. My final question, and maybe I'll start with you, Orson, and, 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 and go to you, Steve, and uh, we can close out from here. My final question just has to do with the Republican Party. I think that a lot of the media basically kind of caricatures the Republican Party as essentially the creature of Trump at this at this point. And they use, you know, they they, they spill a lot of ink on the Matt Gateses and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greens of the of the world and whatnot and, and points to, you know, the um, uh, the exile of of Liz Cheney and the departure pending departure of Adam Kinzinger and others, you know, as sort of like this is the, the Trump party now. But is that it seems to me an oversimplification. And I just wonder what you think of the dynamic within within that party um, today as we head toward midterms and ultimately toward 2024. You know, you know as a Democrat in DC, but at a bipartisan firm, uh, I'll say this, that um, the Republicans are evolving and winning uh, and Trump won. Uh, Trump almost won. Uh, you know, it could be debated, as they say in D.C., if, if it weren't for COVID, maybe he would still be president. Uh, you saw what happened in Virginia. Uh, you're going to see what happens in uh, uh, the midterm elections. So, like it or not, I think the Republicans are evolving and really speaking to what I said earlier, uh, not necessarily focused on tomorrow, uh, really getting their ears tuned in to what's happening today and able to speak to it, maybe through TV, through the media, uh, through a charismatic candidate like Donald Trump, where people I think the Democratic Party is uh, has not uh, been able to evolve quickly enough. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, who I think is brilliant, uh, rightly or wrongly, has led the House Democrats since 2003. 
which is a long time. Uh, and there hasn't been a whole lot of transition. Uh, Joe Biden, who I, I, I love and, 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 and really appreciate his call to service, uh, if he should decide to run, will be, what, 82, 83 in 2004. Uh, so what am I saying? <laughs> uh, I think you'll, it'll be a, a year of change uh, for Democrats should they lose the House. But I have to give Republicans credit uh, for evolving and listening to what people are saying on the street and finding candidates to speak directly to it. I know that's a bit controversial for a Democrat to say, but I think they're doing a really good job of it. So, Steve, bottom line then, do, they, do, do Republican strategists and leadership say, to Orson's point, things are They've done the they've done the right things and and they are moving in the right direction. The only thing they need to complete this picture is to get Trump back uh, out in front, or would they rather he not be back out in uh, out in front because they are things are moving in the right direction and he will just polarize further. Well, both are true. I think I think one size doesn't fit all for Democrats. Um, the country is not Brooklyn uh, for. For you know Republicans that want to expand and 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 move over, you know, um, uh, resurrecting Trump is going to work in some places, it's not others. I mean, the Virginia race was really interesting. Glenn Youngkin kept Trump out of the race basically, and he and he, but yet he made Terry McAuliffe keep kind of talking Trump, Trump, Trump. In my way, in my sense, Glenn Youngkin was a lot more like Mitt Romney, a lot more deal maker, you know, kind of a conservative take on getting things back to work, less regulation, lower taxes. You know, you know, let's not have critical race theory is destabling, destabilizing our our social contract and our identity. And so I think to some degree, Youngkin is going to be an example of a places in purple states on how the, the Republican Party holds its nose with Trump in certain places and lets people come in with a message that works. But I think in a lot of other places, I agree with totally Orson, is that they are evolving. I think the big challenge for them. The Democratic Party has to decide whether it's going to be defined by AOC. Um, and the Republican Party has to be de decide whether it's going to be defined by Marjorie Taylor Greene. And to what degree those uh, forces, whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene and Trump, I mean, to what degree latitude of the most extreme cases are going to become definitive in how that either party de describes itself. I don't see that as a winning hand. I think the Republican Party has remained a focus on the courts, on conservatism, on right to life, on these various issues. And they've been able to become a big tent for the nut jobs and for the people who are pragmatic there. And so Orson calls it right. There's a nimbleness in there that I don't think the Democrats have figured out. They're demonizing cinema, demonizing mansion. And frankly, you know, let's just be honest. It's not just those two people. There are others within that who completely endorse. Did, did they want to pass a $3, $3 trillion bill back better bill? You know, half the Democratic senators, absolutely not. So th where Joe Manchin was, he, he carried the water for them, and they, they were silently behind him because none of them wanted a bill that big. Uh, but they act, oh, you know, I heard from the Daily Beast, and somebody in the Daily Beast the other day says, oh, why doesn't Joe Manchin jump on board? He got it down from $6 trillion to $3 trillion, $3 trillion down to $1.75. And, and I'm like going, well, he wanted zero. But when you kind of look at the, the – that that – arena, I got to tell you, none of those moderate Democrats in the Senate, and you know many of them, wanted that build, build Back Better bill for $3 trillion. So anyway, that's that's how I see it. I think that the nimbleness of the Republican Party has been really impressive, and the Democrats have not evolved there yet. Well, guys, this has been uh, fascinating as uh, as ever. We're going to be watching all of this um, as we uh, as we go into the new year. We'll talk about this more. Hopefully, Steve, you'll come back. Orson, I know you'll be back often uh, next year. So I want to thank both of you. I want to thank everybody for uh, for listening in today and to wish everybody the, the happiest and safest uh, and healthiest of holidays. Um, we will be back early in the um, early in the new year. But until then, uh, thank you again um, and have a great day. Until then, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York.